Well, it's so great to be with you this morning. And my dear friend, Dr. Benny Tate, if I have a brother, it's Benny Tate. We talk about every day, encourage each other in the Lord. You're so blessed to have a pastor like Pastor Benny Tate. You know that. You know that. You are. This morning, if you have your Bibles in honor of the Word of God, would you stand with me and let's just read a passage of Scripture together. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 26. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Other translations say 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And he began the settlement and a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, translated seven to eight million dollars, was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debts. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The service master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. And Father, this morning I pray that you would take these words as we focus on finding freedom from bitterness, a very personal thing in my own life. I pray that your precious Holy Spirit will settle among us and speak to hearts, not as this mere human preacher can do, but your Holy Spirit working through. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. God bless you. Well, it's great to be with you this morning and to share. I uh, would uh, share with you also, I want to introduce a couple guys I have with me. Bryce and Nathan are here. Guys, stand. They're here as uh, ministry students from uh, Columbia International University where I work. We welcome them. Nathan just got a girlfriend, but Bryce is still looking, so uh, they're, they're great, great guys. And... Uh, the reason I introduced them is they have some interest maybe in serving in an internship at some point, and as we work down the roads, uh, down the future together, you never know where that could be, but I brought them with me just to pour into them and love on them and get them to share with you. And Bryce leaned over to me and he said, I told him, I said, guys, when you go to this church, you're not going to want to leave. And Bryce leaned over to me after now his second service, he said, Dr. Smith, I see what you're saying. I don't want to leave. <laughs> So you might just get him to stay if you have a position, Cameron, you know? Just let him stay with you. So, uh, good stuff. <laughs> God, that, that sounds like somebody might be looking for a girlfriend too, Bryce. I'm not sure. I <laughs> ah, will see. This morning, uh, or over the last few weeks, as Dr. Benny and I've uh, talked, and as I've watched your Freedom Series, I, I typically watch your service about every Sunday. Brother Benny asked me if I'd take a topic and address it, and the topic of bitterness and how to overcome bitterness, freedom from bitterness, was a topic that we agreed on. I, I didn't know that Dr. Benny wasn't going to be here at first, and then I was in Tennessee. Now, you guys know that Dr. Benny's from Tennessee. You know that? You ever heard him talk about the volunteers, you know? Well, I was up in Tennessee two weeks ago, and I was... Uh, Spending time actually preparing for being with you and had taken a little vacation time. And he and I like to stay sort of the same place. There's a place called the Christmas Inn up there that's pretty nice. And, and so I was there. And while we were there, the tornadoes hit. And uh, you know what happens when tornadoes hit? They try to get everybody to a safe place. And uh, the Announcers came on and they said, we'd like for everybody there in the Knoxville area to go to Needland Stadium. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Why would they want that? And uh, they said, well, we want you in Needland Stadium because there won't be any touchdowns there this year. 
And so I figured out Brother Benny's in mourning. He's in bitterness this morning over his Tennessee volunteers. In fact, he, I don't know if he knows this, but Charlotte, North Carolina this year, the Tennessee Volunteers and the West Virginia Mountaineers, where I'm an alum, they kick off together. So Benny and I probably won't be speaking that week to each other, so you guys pray for us. This thing of bitterness is something that has destroyed so many lives. Cheryl McGinnis, the last time she saw her husband on the morning of September 11th, 2001, it was a typical day. Been married 18 years. He went out to get ready for his early morning flight. He kissed Cheryl goodbye. They had some devotional time, and that was the last time Cheryl saw her husband, Tom. She started receiving calls from friends, Chris and Bob, and asking if Tom was okay. Cheryl didn't know what was going on on September 11th, and as she turned on the television, was instructed to turn on the television, she was hit by the same thing that all of us have experienced and seen. Guys, I guess we're gonna have to get this turned on. I don't know, it's up there, but uh, you guys have it. Okay, you have it here. So, uh, but she was hit by the thing that all of us remember on September 11th, American Airlines flight, which was the flight that her husband, Tom, was co-pilot of, hit the World Trade Center. She was there in her home and shortly afterwards her pastor, friends, and a big black car drove to her house and several men in dark suits came to the door and Tom, she, was, she heard the news that Tom had died in that horrific day of September 11th. She was shocked. She was overwhelmed. She couldn't imagine how life could go on. And then she remembered, oh no, I have to go to the school and tell my teenage children, Jennifer and Tommy, what has happened. And she drove to the school with her friends, Jeff and Vicki, and told the children, Jesus called Daddy home. The next few hours and days, she didn't really know what hit her. She was in shock. She was in grief. And she began to have some thoughts of why and bitterness began to build up within her. And as she was going through those days, she was reminded of what Tom had told her one morning. Now, Cheryl, if anything happens while I fly, remember to trust God. God will get you through that time. Surround yourself with loving people, people who know Christ, and, and you can make it. The next year, July 8th, 2002, she was invited to Ground Zero, feeling very overwhelmed. She stood there, thoughts flooding her mind again, bitterness in her mind, thinking about what had happened to her husband, how her life had changed over the last few months. And as she stood there and looked into that deep pit, and she herself was in a deep pit, she said she looked up and saw that picture that we saw of the cross, the structure of steel that was left, the cross. And she said at that moment, all that bitterness began to pour out of her. Every time she looked at the cross, she said she could feel a little more leave her. And she could feel Jesus saying, you must forgive those terrorists because I forgave you. Bitterness is something that we all face in life. The loss of a job, the dreaded word cancer, not having, being able to have children, an unexpected tragedy, something going on in our life that has thrown us for a curve, someone walking up to us and being hurtful, saying painful things and doing it over and over again, these things cause us 
to struggle to forgive. Divorce can destroy a life. Speaking of divorce, while I was out in uh, Tennessee, I, I did hear about uh, the, the tornado that was coming through that one house specifically was hit and there was a, a man and woman in that house and uh, it happened sort of in the middle of the night and, and uh, they saw and heard the tornado coming from their house and their house was just lifted up. In fact, their bed was sucked right out of the roof and began to float up into the heavenlies and, and the wife and husband were still in bed and he looked over and she's crying and he said, honey, honey, everything's gonna be okay, just relax. You don't need to cry. We'll just float softly back down to earth. Why are you crying? She looked at him and said, Honey, I'm rejoicing because this is the first time in 20 years that we've been out. <laughs> Their relationship was not too good. She was a bitter woman. Bitterness can encapsulate our minds and life. 21 times in the scripture, bitterness is mentioned. It's usually associated with anger and grudges. It's associated with holding resentment. In the original language, in the Greek, what's fascinating is the word bitterness is associated with poison, extreme poison. I found as I did the word study on this word bitterness, that was a fascinating thing of how poison can kill us, destroy us. Bitterness is mentioned several times in the Bible. In fact, let me give you a few examples of that. Hannah had bitterness over not being able to have children. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and she wept sore. My wife and I, when we got married after two or three years, we were thinking about having children and we were not able to have children, so we begin to go to doctors and do some surgeries and begin to work through that. And I'll never forget the day that we walked into the doctor's office and the doctor, doctor said to us, Mark, Debbie, children are not going to be a part of your future. She's a third grade teacher. I'm a seventh, eighth grade science teacher. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to those words and I know what Hannah felt, bitterness of soul. I remember going home and getting in a little office area and getting on my knees and weeping because we would not be able to have children. Hannah's bitterness of soul. Thank God we do have children. We, we adopted two beautiful young men. And uh, God has blessed us and that's been exciting. But Hannah's bitterness of soul. Job, if you remember the story of Job, had bitterness over losing everything, including his children. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in bitterness of my soul. Job, Job lost everything except his cranky wife, which he wanted to lose. <laughs> the one who kept nitpicking at him and telling him to deny God and leave everything. That's the one he needed to lose, and he didn't lose her. Trying to be funny, okay? You can, you can laugh. That was a laughing point. I got a few laughter there. I'm glad some man didn't say, keep preaching, preacher. So you spared yourself today. Ezekiel had bitterness of soul over the rebellion of the children of Israel. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. The rebellion of the children of Israel had him in bitterness. Ephesians 4.31 reminds us that we are to put away all bitterness, wrath, and malice, and anger. Hebrews 12.15 reminds us to look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness, root of bitterness come up within us. When you begin to see this whole picture of Bitterness, it's not one where we need to dwell. We need freedom from bitterness. And so this story of Matthew chapter 18 gives us a beautiful, beautiful example of how we can be free from bitterness and 
it's not a three-point outline, it's a two-point outline today. I, I don't preach as long as Brother Benny, and uh, so this morning I'll cut it back just a little. Uh, I'm sorry, I probably was longer than he was. So, first of all, how do we overcome bitterness in our lives? Matthew chapter 18 gives us an example. To overcome bitterness, we must first experience forgiveness. Forgiveness involves releasing of debt. We know that Jesus Christ took on our sins, right? He took on our debt, our sin debt. Forgiveness is no longer remembering the past. Aren't you glad for that? It's in the past. God does not remember the sins that you committed. I say glory, hallelujah, that our sins are gone. That's a beautiful thing this morning. As far as the east is from the west, so far has your transgression been removed, Psalms 103, 12. And forgiveness shows compassion and mercy. These words are associated with forgiveness. Now, I don't know about you, but my past is not one that is one that in a in couple of generations back, one that I would be overly proud of. In fact, I come from an area of the country up where Andy Griffith lived, Mayberry, Mount Airy, Blue Ridge Parkway, the mountain area, mountain people. They're hard, they're tough, they fight, they've succeeded. They helped build the Blue Ridge Parkway by hand, literally. I had people, my family members, who literally went out by hand and helped build the Blue Ridge Parkway. The immigrants that came over from other nations did that as well, and it's a fascinating story, but there's a hardness about the culture. But also there's a culture that's connected to moonshine and bootlegging. Well, we're not supposed to drink that stuff now, guys. Come on now. And uh, this moonshine and bootlegging, my dad told me a story not long ago where my uncle and his dad got him out and they used to like to take a little corn and make a little whiskey or a little moonshine and they'd take that and they'd give it to the kids and let them play around in the yard and run around and laugh and they'd laugh at them as they were there in the yard drunk and you know, just a fascinating culture. My uncle, one of my, my uncles, if I were to go back, would, would be one who was a fighter. He had uh, fights, he had pulled a gun on someone, he had a knife fights with people. He was known as a mean man. I have another uncle. He had a, a sawed-off shotgun and he carried it around with him. Just a very tough culture. But something happened with regard to the past. My little four foot eleven grandmother, about 90 pounds soaking wet, she met with someone and found Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad for that this morning? She found Jesus Christ and today 30-some family members now are not bootleggers, but they go to church every Sunday, and Jesus Christ has made them a new creation in Christ Jesus. You know, if you're a Christian this morning, Christ does a work of change in your life. If you haven't experienced forgiveness of sins and experienced the change that Christ can bring within, I challenge you this morning to meet my Savior. Jesus Christ still delivers from sin. Jesus Christ still forgives. Jesus Christ still lifts the load of sin as never before. Thank God for that this morning. Aren't you glad for that? And that's the forgiveness that we experience. In fact, the passage of Scripture that I read in Matthew chapter 18 lays out for us so clearly this whole idea of forgiveness of sins. That picture is one where Jesus forgives, or in this case, a servant who owes a great debt is forgiven by the master for seven to eight million dollars that he could never pay. That's what Jesus did for us. I was just looking as I was preparing for this at Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Here was the way we used to live. A life lived in sin. We were sexually immoral. We were unclean. We were lustful. We have evil desires. We're covetous. We worship idols in our lives. We live for self in Colossians 3, verses 8 through 9. 
anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language and lying. That's the way we used to be. That's the seven or eight million dollar debt that we had in our lives. But God, who is rich in mercy, he forgave us of all of that and turned us on a new direction and put us on the right path whereby every single day we can walk with Jesus and be forgiven. And to experience forgiveness is a wonderful thing of peace in our lives. Man, I'm about to start preaching like Brother Benny. I love to watch him preach, man, when he gets going. But that's something to get excited about. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we might be forgiven. Hallelujah this morning. We're forgiven in Jesus Christ. This thing of forgiveness is not something we need to take for granted. But secondly, I see not only do we experience forgiveness in order to overcome bitterness, but we must also extend forgiveness to others. Do you have bitterness in your life over something that's happened? Freedom from the life of bitterness comes through forgiving others. Colossians 3 says it this way. Forgive one another as Christ forgave you. Matthew 6, 12 says this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Debt is what is owed as a consequence of wrongdoing. Debt is what turns into grudges and bitterness. And Jesus is saying to us through this parable, you must learn when you are forgiven of the seven to eight million, you don't go do what the next guy does who only was owed a hundred silver coins and say to that man, you better pay up or I'm going to throw you in debtor's prison, which is what they did in that day. And that's what the story, if I'd read it on out, said that the man tried to do. And Jesus says to him, oh, no, if you don't forgive, don't expect to be forgiven. That's close preaching, folks. Do you forgive? You want to get over bitterness in your life? Forgive. Now, let's look at the steps of bitterness, this root of bitterness, just for a moment. First of all, and this is not originally with me, I've read several things, so I couldn't pin down one particular, and I put it in my own words. So I want to give credit to that person's out there, whoever they are, okay? But this in my mind as I was reading several sources. Here's what I came up. So it's a Mark Smith sort of look at what all the experts are saying. But here's what happens with the counselors and psychologists with regard to bitterness. First of all, an offense occurs. Someone offends us. We get upset because someone doesn't speak to us in church or 